Well, good morning to everyone. Good morning. The title of my sermon is The Plumb Line, and that will become clearer as we progress. But I am essentially talking about the book of Amos. I'm going to provide some context and get us thinking about some of the visions that the prophet Amos has. Um, I want to start by asking you to consider the way that our world, the way that our culture in particular, tries to keep us safe. The measures that are made to make us feel safe and secure. And also how some of these extreme measures can seem over the top. I mean, the number of safety warning labels on not just food, but clothing, material, there's lots of warnings and, you know, safety labels on almost everything we buy. Think about the time, you know, you get on an airplane and we put on our seatbelt for safety, right? Which will help us maybe not bump around, but how much safety is that really providing? Um, on a kind of serious note, TSA, the Transportation Security Administration, I think is what that means, recently did a study on uh, safety in relation to gun safety, and they had general inspectors go through you know, security with guns to see if they could smuggle them through, and it turned out that 95% of the time they were able to do that, right? Despite all those safety measures, all those lines, all those scans, all those checks. So think about the political appeal on both sides of the aisle to public safety and how the sort of dream of ending local crime, of ending global terrorism, seems just as likely as creating a world void of sin altogether. Then you add to the equation, what makes one person feel safe can make the other person feel just as unsafe. And honestly, that's kind of the issue that the Israelites were facing during the time of Amos. Their problem was, what does it mean to be safe? What creates safety? How do we maintain that security? How is order maintained? How do we determine what's right, what's just? What's the measuring line for those things? And the problem is twofold. It's not just determining, but it's maintaining and <coughs> keeping those standards that God has given you to provide true security, true safety, and justice. So I'm going to start by having us look at one verse from Amos, and I'm going to, going to continually uh, contextualize this book and uh, drive a message forward about the plumb line and what Amos meant by that. So Amos 5.3 is where I'll start. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to Israel. Your city that marches out a thousand strong will have only a hundred left. Your town that marches out a hundred strong will have only ten left. Sometimes there is safety in numbers, but sometimes numbers are deceiving. Sometimes you start with a thousand, you end up with a hundred. A hundred becomes ten. Ten becomes one. What can seem like a large army in this case will be whittled down to a small number. Sometimes numbers can be deceiving. And this message that Amos is speaking to Israel is important. To, it's important to keep in mind that they're prospering. It's a golden age of peace, prosperity. Uh, they have wealth, prestige. The social institutions are well structured and ordered. The financial wealth is above and beyond what it had normally ever been in Israel. Um, they are powerful enough to build strong walls, towers, to protect them from enemies. They have all these armies, hundreds and thousands of men protecting them, right? So they feel safe and they feel secure. And here Amos is saying what looks like safety, what looks like security is not what it seems. Sometimes safety in numbers is an illusion. And 
despite doing some of the things that the Lord despises, some of the things that the Lord explicitly told them not to do, Israel is doing. Yet, they look around and they see things prospering and they think this must be a blessing from God, even though it doesn't align with his word. So Amos is speaking to them during that time of prosperity, telling them to measure things according to what the Lord has given them. That will bring safety. That will bring security. That will bring justice. That will be, bring righteousness long term. So Amos steps in the middle of what is a flourishing nation and declares that they're living on their illusion of safety. God will judge and destroy Israel, its temple. They will be put into exile. Despite that they look around them and see nothing but peace and prosperity. So you can imagine how people would respond to this message at that time. Um, a well-known psychologist by the name of Abraham Maslow created this hierarchy of needs. And I think it's only anecdotally true, but he started by creating this sort of foundation at the bottom, which is our physiological needs, air, water, food. Once we meet those things, he said the second greatest concern was safety. And then up through this hierarchy, once you have food and water, then you can think about your safety. It's the second most important thing beyond our very basic needs, according to this hierarchy of needs. Whether that's true or not is beyond what I really want to get into, but I think it suggests the importance of our safety, how much we value that sense of safety and why many of the times our culture, our government, our world tries to create a sense of that security. So Amos steps in and he challenges that. He sort of punctures this safety bubble that people had created around themselves and he wants to destroy that in many ways. And you can imagine if someone does that to you, how you would respond. And it makes sense that they responded rather um, violently, okay? <laughs> so, and I'm gonna provide one example of an exchange that Amos had with another figure named Amaziah. Um, so Amaziah is a royal priest, a Levitical priest, from generations and generations who has this great sort of, in the hierarchy, he's greatly viewed and esteemed. And people respect him. You know, he's rubbing shoulders with the king. Uh, the people look to him as a, a religious authority, okay? And then Amos steps in the scene. And Amos is a prophet from a rural countryside, in essence, with little to no authority in relation to Amaziah's social authority. And he challenges him in a way. What's the result? Well, he's called a, Amos is called a conspirator. He's not patriotic. He challenges the king and the religious structure in Israel. So he's called a conspirator. And Amaziah, in this exchange I'm about to read, addresses the problem of Amos. Let me read this for you. This is Amos 7. Let's turn there. Verses 10 through 15. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words. For this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile, away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go and prophesy to my people Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. And he goes on from there. 
So we get a good picture, I think, a starting point to consider who this figure of Amos really is. We hear that he's uh, tender of sycamore fig trees. Uh, furthermore, in the book of Amos, we hear that he travels north, he travels west, he knows regionally that area. He is a shepherd, and he's not just a simple herdsman, but he's a manager of flocks. He travels to Samaria, so in a sense he's sort of going international in that sense, in that region at least. Um, he knows the patriarchal history of Israel, and this book bears witness to that. This book also is poetry, a specific kind of poetry we might call judgment poetry, largely. Um, it's very well written and composed and thoughtful in that way. And despite that we might sort of associate cert certain things with a shepherd, he is very well educated and literate, and he knows the history, and he knows the region, and he knows the area. He has a set of uncommon experiences. He's an outsider. He's from Judah, the southern kingdom, and he's speaking to Israel, the northern kingdom. He is an outsider, a sort of man with uncommon experiences addressing the people. We also know that he has a sense of authority and that he is a prophet of God. I mean, how do you know that? I mean, we look at <laughs> this book, this book that people probably didn't respond to so favorably, and we think, here it is, preserved in the book of the you know, Minor Prophets. And we also know that he spoke with authority because many of the things that he said came true. So let's consider the opening verse of this book. This is verse 1, chapter 1. The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, the vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Uzziah, the king of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Joash, was king of Israel. Okay. So this book is written somewhere between 760 and 750 BC. He references two kings, which places sort of the way that we can frame this as a two-year period somewhere in that re region. Uh, many suggest that this earthquake occurred around um, 760 BC. Um, and then the other important date to consider is for, about 40 years later, after Amos spoke, the temple falls and the Israelites are taken into exile. All the things that Amos talked about come true about 40 years after he spoke. And that adds to his authority. Okay. He is, and it's important to understand the geography because this book is very much in conversation with the nation of both Israel and Judah and those surrounding them. But we see in this sort of red square um, Israel and the um, green arrow is Assyria. This is a sort of lurking army in the background, that, this invading army that's going to come in that he's talking about. Um, and we see he is from Tekoa, this sort of blue circle right uh, south of Jerusalem, close to Bethlehem. And he's referring to Bethel a lot. And, and Bethel is important in this uh, time because there was a shrine in Bethel that was semi-paganistic, semi-worshipping the God of Yahweh. It was a mixture and fully corrupt, in essence. And so this is the geography of the land. And this is important to keep in mind as we look at the structure of the work. Um, I just read the, the, the preface here, but he goes through these nations, Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Tyre Edom, Ammon, Moab, Judah, and Israel. And he goes through them one by one. These are mainly Gentile nations. These are, this is not the nation of Israel. And as a reader, I mean, my first thought is why is he talking to Gentile nations and casting judge, judgment on them? and explaining all the things that will happen to them. And I think part of the answer is that these nations had once made a pact with Israel, and God was witness to those pacts, those treaties, and they have broken them 
And so God is judging their broken treaties. They have done a lot of violent, what we might call war crimes, things that are almost unspeakable that are recounted in the book of Amos. Then we have to consider, um, the, sorry, the second part of uh, this sort of outline of the book is an address to the northern kingdom, a message to Israel. And so um, we see on this map Israel and Judah and the surrounding nations. And you can see that they are all surrounding them, Israel and Judah. And if you're in Israel at this time and Amos is speaking to you, how would you hear him? Well, I think it can best be characterized as their funeral oration. He is giving their eulogy with great authority from the mouth of a prophet. It should be sobering for them to hear this judgment on their land when they're looking around, again, seeing it so prosperous, wondering, is this going to come true? Are you really a prophet from God? Especially when you have the royal priest telling you that he's not a prophet and he's not telling the truth, things are prospering, they will continue that way, despite that you're looking at God's word and hearing a discrepancy. Who do you believe? Who do you turn to? So this is important to understand how Israel would have received his message. Um, what exactly happened that Israel des deserved this judgment? And I'm not going to go through the litany of things that he recounts, but there's essentially two things that I, I think we can consider. There's a social abuse of power, and there's religious corruption. The social abuse, things like levying taxes against the poor that were unnecessary and unfair, um, the poor and the oppressed are more poor and oppressed, sometimes enslaved because they can't pay their debts. He talks about so many awful things, including even incest. There's a religious compromise, too. I, mi I, I mentioned this mixture of paganism with uh, worship of God. And that's through and through the system and creating a fully corrupt system. And there's prophets, Amos and others, that have come and spoken to them about this, but they usually reject them, tell them to go back to where they came from, right? That happens again and again. And they're engaging in insincere religious worship. So let me move towards sort of the heart of what I'm going to get at here. And that is the second, let's say, half of the book is a series of visions that Amos has. And there's five visions, and they're all about one thing, and that thing they're about is the judgment of Israel. And the, the five visions um, have a sequence to them. And the first two visions are very uh, catastroph catastrophic events, a locust plague, right? An all-consuming fire comes in, very catastro catastrophic events. The second two visions of a basket of fruit and a plumb line are symbolic visions. And then the final vision is different in form and content. Um, it's a destruction of the temple. This vision uh, sort of sequence is recounted in the book of Amos in a way that you can imagine if God sends you one, two, three, four, five visions, you can imagine how you would feel the need to express this to people. And he has this sequence of visions. There's a progression. And the one I want to focus on, though, is the symbolic plumb line vision. How many of you actually know what a plumb line is? Just out of curiosity. So quite a few. OK. Um, I'll illustrate for you. <laughs> I brought one. <laughs> so this is a vision that Amos has of a hand the hand of God holding a plumb line, okay? And he's holding this by a wall, right? And we have to think about the purpose of a plumb line. What purpose does a plumb line serve? Well, a carpenter might use a plumb line to determine whether a wall is perfectly vertical. Or a painter might use a plumb line to determine, you know, if you're starting here, do you want to end directly below that point. From point A to B, it would have a direct vertical line. 
it would assure that things were straight, that there is a straightness in the measuring. Despite that the eye might see things straight, that can sometimes be deceiving, right? But if you have a plumb line, it's not going to lie. It'll be right every time. And the frustrations of the, the painter or the person building the wall won't come into account because it will provide an objectively line, objective line that's either straight or not. So what does it mean when, in this book, uh, God says he was setting a plumb line among his people? Okay, so you have to imagine there's a vision that Amos has. He sees God. He sees a hand holding a plumb line, and God says, I'm setting a plumb line among my people. Knowing what you know about a plumb line, what does that mean? Well, it means that God is setting a standard. Right? And we are to measure things according to his standard. His standard of right and wrong, his standard of justice, his standard of mercy, his standard of faithfulness, and all of those uh, considerations that we make about life, about reality, need to be weighed according to God's standard. It doesn't, God's standard doesn't change according to the whims of culture. It doesn't change, and there, there is a consistency <coughs> For example, in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, forever. And there is a sense of stability. There's a sense of assurance in that. We can measure what is right, what is wrong, what is just, what is right according to God's standard, God's word. And people should line their lives up according to this standard, Amos is telling them. We should line our lives up according to God's standard I am telling you, and I think we have to consider uh, this message in terms of the context of Israel, keeping in mind that they are looking around seeing a prosperous nation, seeing things flourishing, and wondering, it looks good to me. <laughs> I don't see what's wrong here. And that's why the plumb line speaks into that, it says, not according to God's measure, and it doesn't lie. The other thing about a plumb line is that it's a testing instrument. It tests things. And he's holding this you know, up. And you're thinking, what is being tested here? And I think there's two main things that are being tested that I keep coming back to. And that's the social institutions and the religious institutions at that time. Meaning that people who are hearing this are thinking, our king is going to be dethroned. Our kingdom, our laws, our orders, all the things that are put in place, you're saying are going to be destroyed. That's a big threat to their safety and security. He's saying that they're, where they worship, their temple is going to be destroyed. And people are thinking, where am I going to worship God if what you're saying is true? We'll have no king. We'll have no place to worship. What will come of the nation of Israel? So that's the sense that he is conveying to them. And you know what? A lot of these things that Amos talks about are just ignored by the people. But the authority of his word is that as a prophet, what he says comes true. Forty years later, Israel is invaded. The walls come down. The temple comes down. They are put into exile. What he says comes true. And so the judgment he has is not to denigrate them or to degrade them or to make them feel anything other than a sense of repentance, of turning from one way that they feel is right in their own eyes to the standard God has set before them. They, it begs a question, are they going to listen to Amos? Are you going to hear these words and, and turn in that way? And they don't, unfortunately. And so it's a powerful message. And it's one that Amos speaks, but is a prophetic message that is uh, emblematic of what we hear from a lot of the prophets. Um, oops, I forgot that. But let's look at a verse from Isaiah. This is Isaiah 28, 17. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. In other words, life is measured by God's definition of justice and righteousness. And what does this mean? Um, when I thought of this measuring, this testing instrument, one image came to mind in particular of the temple at that time. 
you have to imagine this beautiful temple that's, you know, marble stairs, gold everywhere. But there's something happening inside that's somewhat gruesome. <laughs> there's animals being slaughtered. I mean, it's hot. You're in the middle of a desert. Carcasses are, there's blood everywhere. I mean, this is what they're doing. They're constantly offering animal sacrifices in a way that is gross and somewhat disgusting. I mean, in that area. There's no air conditioning. You know, you're walking, you're seeing this happen all the time. The smoke is going up. You can smell it. And I think part of the, the, that gross, disgusting, that, that sense that I think you would have is an image of how God sees our sin as gross, as disgusting, as something that just has that same objective badness to it, that feel that this is how God sees sin, right? When we see these animals, when we imagine that vision. And the only thing that could ever bring true righteousness, true justice, is God's only son, which is a sacrifice unlike any of those other sacrifices they had seen on a scale that truly defines justice and righteousness. And I want to talk about those two concepts because Amos is very concerned about justice and righteousness. He says uh, those words at least 12 times in the book, and they're almost always occurring side by side. When we hear about justice, we hear about righteousness. They're always kind of going back and forth. Sometimes they're almost synonymous. And of the 12 times we hear them, um, I think a good takeaway to consider is why is it that we can't separate justice from righteousness? And it has to do with the, the nature of God, who God is. He is both just and righteous. Where one line begins and another one ends is hard to say, hard to perceive. And that's the nature of God. And his nature is in his law that he had given to the people. And so that law is really important, especially at this time when they are transgressing it. They are doing, like I said, so many things that are barely worth mentioning. But one of the things that they had in that law was a way to protect the poor, the vulnerable. And here is a verse that sort of gets at the heart of what's gone wrong and what they're actually doing and why Amos feels the need to talk about judgment. He says, they trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. This is just one example of justice gone wrong. But just, it's, this injustice is hating those who do right, not willing to um, help those who need more help than you because you want to maybe increase your riches. It's um, a willingness. Injustice is a willingness to take a bribe, right? It's what Amos calls a bitterness that you have towards others. And we could spend a lot of time on injustice and where justice goes wrong, but I think it's important to consider justice properly understood. What does that sound like? What does that look like? Um, in general, we might say it's responding to something God's put on your heart, something that is an upward calling that might be met with incredible resistance if you imagine trying to implement that in society. I think of Martin Luther King Jr. who spoke uh, about justice in society and the civil rights as a, the figurehead of that movement quoted Amos 5, uh, when he said, let justice roll on like a river, let righteousness flow like a never-ending stream. He stood up to a calling that he felt needed to be implemented despite the backlash that he faced, despite the turbulent resistance, he stood up for greater justice. And that is emblematic, I think, of what is being talked about here. Because the Lord is demanding in this book a, not only a proper ordering of society, he's not saying the church should necessarily create the laws or maintain necessarily that order at a sort of uh, governmental level. But the church, I think, should respond to imp 
the improper order in society, when there's unjust laws. It is our job to respond to that. I think about not just what this book refers to, the poor, the orphans, and the widows, all directly mentioned as vulnerable, marginalized individuals that need our mercy, our care, but also the greater injustices of the world, including the unborn. And we have to ask ourselves, are we doing enough? Are we burying our heads in the sand? Do we feel powerless to these greater injustices? What are we doing as a church, as an individual even? And I want to be clear, I'm not arguing that we should be social physicians. I'm not even arguing for all kinds of social justice. What I'm talking about is an awareness that social justice should happen, but we have to be aware of the issue. And the issue is personal sin. If you're fighting for social justice, if you're fighting for justice, and you don't acknowledge not only your sin, but the sin of all people, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin is a human condition that happens after the fall. And when you understand that that is the illness that plagues the world, you have a call for justice that makes more sense, that is different when you don't acknowledge personal sin. There's only one great shepherd, and that's Jesus Christ. Only he can cure the ills of the world, can prevent cancerous recurrences from coming back. There's one great physician, and we should look to him. When I'm talking about justice, I think we're skeptical of that word because we hear social justice talked about so much from a secular perspective even. So what separates our understanding of that from others I think is properly defined when we turn to Jesus who does define justice and righteousness for us. But this starts with you personally and that's what I, I'm, I'm trying to get across. And What Amos would try to say is think about your own personal sin. What are you doing to set things right? If your eye is <laughs> filled with sin, if your eye is dark, your whole body will be dark. You need to approach things by approaching your personal sin first. Then maybe move out to your family. Then maybe move out to the greater world and the community. But it starts there. And we can't start with these great greater injustices before we start with our own personal sins, I believe. God has set the standard. This plumb line, in a sense, is Jesus. He defines what is right, what is straight, what is correct, what is not crooked. How do we determine justice? This was the problem. How do we determine security? How do we determine what is right? Well, we look to Jesus. He incarnate embodies perfect justice, perfect security, perfect peace. The things he said, the things he did, clarify that in a way that Amos's book only is a shadow of. So Jesus said, the poor are always with us, and we should help them at any time we want. Think about what Jesus' words mean in light of Amos here. This is from Matthew. This is when he's casting all the woes on the Pharisees. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. And I think this is so powerful because it's hard to define what exactly is justice in a legalistic way. Tithing, cumin, mint, dill, giving your money in 10, 20, 30 percent, you can define what, that, what you're giving. But when you talk about, are you merciful? How do you evaluate that? Are you practicing justice? What does that look like? How do you measure that? Well, there's where the plumb line comes in. Jesus tells us to look around us. He tells us to feed the sick, feed the hungry. <laughs> take care of the sick, <laughs> clothe those without clothes, to continue to bring people in to the kingdom, 
And we should always be on the lookout for the vulnerable, for the marginalized, with an awareness of our sin and the sin of others and why we feel empowered by Christ to help others who are inflicted with the same sin that we have been inflicted with. But we have to look at what Jesus did, the clearest example of justice and righteousness, the plumb line that everything else should line up against in our life. What separates us from the people that Amos spoke to? Well, as you can tell, I think it's Jesus, who is a much better hope, a much clearer image of these things that he defined, that Amos defined. This message shouldn't end bleak. It should end with an encouragement to live more like Jesus, to see that he is a true measure of security, of justice, righteousness, peace, prosperity, love. All these things we should turn to him to define. If we imitate him, we will be doing the very things that Amos commanded God's people to do. That's where we can look to and have greater hope, have greater joy, have greater perspective, and feel confident in an objective measure of true prosperity. So let's end in prayer and um, ask God to continue to measure our success by the plumb line that he has set before us.